So it's, um, it's nice to be here. Thanks very much for having me for presentation. I'd like to uh, show some of our work on phase transformation and transport in hydrogen-based uh, steel production. We are interested in these types of phenomena because the um, metallurgical sector is a so-called hard to abate sector when it comes to carbon dioxide emissions. And why is that so? The reason for that is that the fossil carbon carrier are not just used for heating the furnaces in this area, but for extracting the metals from the oxides, we are dealing with heterogeneous redox reactions, typically. And um, these redox reactions have the structure that you see here, where we have, for instance, metal oxides that are exposed to carbon monoxide as a typical representative of such carriers. And in that heterogeneous redox reaction, you extract the actual metal, in our case, of course, the iron, and produce carbon dioxide. And the mineral that is mostly used for this uh, steel production is hematite, and hematite has a stoichiometry of Fe2O3. And the carbon monoxide is produced mostly in blast furnaces by exposing the coke to hot oxygen, which produces carbon dioxide that goes in the furnaces through the boudoir reaction, producing carbon monoxide, and that acts as the fossil reductant. Now, the important task for the ongoing research is to find scientific ideas for replacing and eliminating the carbon from these types of heterogeneous redox reactions. And there are different opportunities available. You can, for instance, use hydrogen instead of carbon as a reductant. The thermodynamics is, of course, quite different, and that must be considered in such ventures. And you must also consider that hydrogen alone is often quite expensive to cool down and to transport, and hence different types of hydrogen vectors are also explored. Hydrogen vectors means these are molecules that contain hydrogen also in radical form, and that is what we call a plasma, when you expose the um, gas mixture to very high electrical excitation. And you can use electrons, of course, directly, like in electrolysis. So there are different um, types of materials that have a very high carbon footprint, and these heterogeneous redox equations and the high temperatures that are involved qualify iron steel production as the biggest single industrial emitter of carbon dioxide emissions, even before chemicals, plastics, cement or aluminum and so on. So it's a very big and very interesting task to pursue. We have here kind of an overview map that shows you different possibilities and variants uh, that you can unleash to attack this type of problem. In the middle, you can see different types of uh, feedstocks like pellets, lump ores, even industry waste we work with, with fines and so on. You can also use scrap, of course. And then, as I've already mentioned, you can replace the carbon, of course, by hydrogen, which, of course, is very difficult and expensive to produce. And so we also look into other carriers such as ammonia, methane, methanol, and so on, even including liquid organic hydrogen carriers of different types. And then you have different reduction principles to which I have already alluded to. Now, these different combinations translates to different types of furnaces, be it a direct reduction reactor, as you see here, or electric arc furnaces. That is something that we do a lot that is called hydrogen-based plasma reduction, or of course, the blast furnaces, which are currently the biggest producer of, of carbon dioxide. And that's why we also do research on making these furnaces more sustainable. And of course, electrolysis is also possible. In my lab, we are particularly interested in three different directions. So we use hydrogen-based direct reduction, where we use hydrogen vectors, we use electrons directly in electrolysis, and we work a lot on plasma-based, so hydrogen plasma-based 
reduction of metal oxides. Now let me start to go a little bit deeper into one process that we refer to as direct reduction, which means we expose solid iron oxides to very hot hydrogen. And this is shown in this little animation movie where you can see that the iron pellets, these are sintered polycrystalline hematite materials of about a centimeter diameter, are charged into a big uh, shaft furnace. And in a counter stream reactor principle, the furnace is then charged with uh, hot hydrogen, which is reducing the material, as I've showed before, producing an iron, pure iron sponge type of material. And the redox product is water instead of carbon dioxide. And then you can take this type of iron sponge material, so pure iron sponge material, and charge it, as you see here, for instance, in an electric arc furnace in order to melt it down and make your alloys or mix it with scrap and so on. So when we track the kinetics, the reduction kinetics associated with such processes, you can see here on the right hand side the first derivative of the reduction, which is then the reduction rate. And you see the transformation from the original mineral, which is the hematite in trigonal crystal structure, which goes very fast into the cubic inverse spinel, Fe3O4, which we call magnetite. And from the magnetite, it goes into the likewise cubic iron oxide, which we call wüstite. However, the wüstite further to iron, to alpha iron reduction, is very sluggish. It's very slow, as you can see here. So you lose about one order of magnitude in reduction speed during this process. This is captured here also by an in situ experiment in a scanning electron microscope, which is done by my colleague, Professor Mark Willinger. And you see that behind this flat surface, you can see a rough appearing surface, and that is a wüstite single crystal. And in the microscope, this material is exposed to hydrogen, and you can see how the material reacts. And the iron is overgrowing that material. Let me go back. The iron is overgrowing that material, and you can see how this uh, forms a thick layer of iron on the oxide. When you cut these samples through and look a little bit more in the inside, then you can see that during such a process, the iron is indeed surrounding the FAO wüstite and leaving a lot of free volume also behind. And when you blow that up yet a little bit further, you can appreciate that when you want to bring the oxygen out, which is the main point of a reduction process, the oxygen must be not only stripped of its two electrons, but it also must diffuse outbound through that iron to form water at the reaction surface. And that is a process that can be very sluggish when that iron layer surrounding the FAO is very dense, as you can see here. That is schematically shown here at the atomic scale. You have the wüstite on the inside. The oxygen must be transported through that iron layer, which is the slowest um, process in that chain. And then the iron layer grows towards the inside. Also, the microstructure evolution is quite interesting and quite complicated. You have, as I said, as a starting material, the hematite, which you see on the left-hand side. The black lines are indicating the grain boundaries in that sintered polycrystalline oxidic Fe2O3 material. But you also have about 25% of initial uh, sintered porosity, which is very important because that porosity determines how easily you can get rid of the water that you produce as a redox product. In the first step, after one minute at 700 degrees centigrade, you can see the growth of the magnetite of the cubic crystal structure in an Avrami type nucleation and growth process going into the hematite material and removing oxygen from that crystal. The next transformation step that you can realize after five minutes, where the magnetite goes into the wüstite, you see heterogeneous waves of this transformation, which is in the nature of the phase transformation, a very interesting process. 
probably related to a reshuffling of the iron atoms um, into that kind of magnetite wüstite compound. When we look at the material after 30 minutes at 700 degree centigrade, you can see in terms of the blue color how the alpha iron has been uh, formed. You, however, can also realize the enormous porosity that has been building up in the material. And that is also shown here with ongoing work where in the inverse pole figure, so in the texture map called IPF here, you have exactly the same texture. That means it's isostructural and you have the same 001 crystallographic orientation. But in the face map, when you take a sufficient number of Kikuchi lines, you can realize that there's indeed a phase separation into magnetite, which is the orange color, and wüstite, which is the blue color. And from the kernel average misorientation map, you can see that also substantial geometrically necessary dislocation populations are involved. There's, however, also a complex microstructure formation where you can see uh, delamination and damage phenomena. That's quite interesting. When you blow that up a little bit, you can see on the one hand, indeed, these very dense iron layers to which I have referred to before. But due to the very high volume changes that are associated with this transformation step, you can also see that in some areas you still have that very dense iron layer, while in other areas surrounding the wüstite you have delamination and even damage and fracture, as you see here. That is quite important because it must be understood because that is a region where you provide fresh new interfaces at which the reaction can take place much faster, the reduction reaction, and you can also have a chance to host and transport the water away because you must bring the oxygen and the water out of the material. Now, when we walk through such a commercial pellet, as you see here, sintered polycrystalline hematite, we cut that open and you can already see that sintered microstructure. And when you then blow that up yet a little bit further, you can see that porosity to which I have already alluded. You can study again the face map, the microstructures, the low angle grain boundaries and so on. And then we were interested how I can cast this into a corresponding model. And we formulated a corresponding kahn hilliard phase field model and combined it with the Allen kahn theory that is a variant of the Ginzburg-Landau theory for non-conserved uh, structure variables. And that enables you to solve the transport equations and also the phase transformation as you can see here in this simulation animation. So you can see how the hydrogen is entering the material, how the oxygen is being removed and how the iron is formed here in terms of the yellow color. So we take several patches now out of this work and render it digital as you can see here. We start only from the Wüstheit phase, that means the energy landscape for that simulation uh, in the form of a Landau double well potential has been fitted to the thermodynamic data for wüstite and for alpha iron. And you can see in the upper round, upper row, the concentration of the oxygen, as you see here. You can see in the middle row the formation of the alpha iron, <clears throat> and in the bottom row you can see the Mises stresses. And you can see <clears throat> that the Formese stresses are getting indeed very high, which is not very realistic when you only take a purely elastic calculation. So we have also modified that mechanically um, driven phase field model and rendered it elastoplastic. That means upon reaching a certain strength level, the material becomes plastic and produces dislocations. That is in the simulation very important to include because the dislocations have much higher transport, hence diffusion coefficients, than the undefected bulk material. Another aspect refers to the evolution of the porosity. I've already mentioned that porosity is inherited from the sintering process, but during the further reduction under hydrogen atmosphere here at 700 degrees centigrade, you can see that after 10 minutes, after two hours and so on, how that 
porosity, which comes from the mass loss related to the loss of oxygen, is growing up to 45-47%. And when you break these uh, samples open, uh, starting originally from a hematite single crystal at 700, and then have the sample at two hours, you can see that very fine substructure, as you can see here, with some causal porosity, but also with very fine porosity. Here's a blow up of the same scenario. That is a very important point to keep in mind, because again, the connection of that percolative surface area is very important to understand the transport of the water of the redox product outbound. We also looked at that porosity with tomographic probing methods, such as you see here, again, to better understand the connectivity of these types of processes. And you can see here again, by using the same type of mechanically modified phase field model in the form of a coupled Kahn-Hilliard and Allen-Kahn type of theory, that when you cool the material down and you have close porosity, as you can see here, it hosts the water. That means the water cannot escape from the material, but it remains inside of the material. And that can be seen also in electron microscopy when you expose the specimens to electron diffraction. You can see that the material that had been already uh, reduced into alpha iron at the end of the process is becoming reoxidized by that hosted water to form new fresh iron oxide at the perimeter of these porous, like you see here or here, that had contained the redox product water. That means when you cannot get the water out of the material during reduction, you are producing new oxide. So that's kind of an overview picture that shows you that we have a complex interplay of that evolving porosity, of the inherited porosity, of the formation of the water and of the reoxidation. We then also went further down to the atomic scale for doing such experiments also in an atom probe. So we have an atom probe laboratory where you can expose the actual atom probe needles to uh, hydrogen, or in our case to labeled hydrogen, as heavy hydrogen, which we call deuterium. And the deuterium reacts with that Wüstheit FAO interface at atomic scale, and we can track it in the atom probe by a cryogenic ultra high vacuum transport unit. And you can see here the perfect iron oxide after zero seconds exposure in our atomic scale steel factory, if you want. Then after five seconds, you can see that uh, at these temperatures, a very fast atomic scale reaction takes place. And you have only the remaining iron oxide here in the center. And on the outside, you have already formed the pure alpha iron. And the same is true for 10 seconds. Now, with that, we can also study not just the reduction kinetics, where you see in this overview slab that you have, again, the iron on the outside here colored in pink. On the inside, you have, again, the remaining iron oxide because we interrupted the experiment. And here at the parameter, you can see where in the first nanopores, the heavy water, the deuterium water, the labeled water has been formed. So we can understand the interplay of oxygen mass loss, transport, water formation, porosity formation, and uh, the transport of the iron. And that is here an animation where you can see that process quite nicely. And again, it serves as a basic study to better understand how the redox processes are really working, how the porosity is formed at the nanoscale, and how the water can be removed from such uh, steel reactors. What is always also very interesting to see when you do such experiments in atom probe is the fact that you see the rest of the chemistry also. And the iron oxide, even though the quality in steelmaking of the hematite is very high in terms of contaminants, you still here and there can appreciate and see that you have so-called gank elements. Gank elements are impurities in the oxides. And they are often correlated, when you look at the atomic scale, 
with the occurrence of the first water that is being formed. Which is not surprising, because elements like sodium and potassium, or natrium and calcium, are associated with a very high affinity to water and to oxygen. We then also went on to further study the use of other hydrogen vectors. Just to remind you, hydrogen vectors are alternative gases that contain hydrogen but are easier to transport or buy on the global market. And one important molecule is of course ammonia, NH3, and you see that this molecule is carrying three hydrogen atoms for one nitrogen atom. So originally that type of molecule from the Haber-Bosch process was of course developed and used globally um, to transport the nitrogen as a fertilizer for the agriculture industry. And today we use the nitrogen as a transport unit for bringing the hydrogen to places where you need it. Because you don't need the hydrogen in agriculture, but you need the hydrogen in metallurgy and chemistry. And what was interesting to see is you go through this autocatalytic reaction where you strip the ammonia of its nitrogen and hydrogen. That means you have a catalytic process which is driven by the formation of iron that is even reducing the splitting temperature for this reaction from about 450 to a little bit less than 400 degree centigrade and even down to 370, 380 degrees centigrade. And then you get pure hydrogen and that reacts with the iron oxide to produce pure iron. And we can see that the kinetics for the two processes, that means hydrogen-based and ammonia-based reduction, is in principle the same. And when you look at the steel that you produce in that way, so at the iron in the iron sponge that you see here on the right-hand side in terms of the electron backscatter map, uh, looks very similar to the pure iron that you get from direct reduction at first view. However, when you look at the chemistry, you can see that you have a very high nitrogen content also. And when you indeed do a phase discriminating EBSD analysis, you can see that a relatively high fraction, up to 40%, consists of iron nitride, as you see here. That means you're forming nitrides, and we study those nitrides also at the atomic scale because that is in itself a very interesting um, uh, information together. But when you take this iron iron nitride mixture, bring it again in a, a reduction uh, in a sorry in a furnace like an electric arc furnace, as you can see here, due to the vapor pressure, the nitrogen goes out, and you are producing uh, pure steel. Just one slide about one of the alternative techniques that we are pursuing in our lab that is called hydrogen-based plasma smelting reduction. And that is a process where you expose the iron oxide directly in a liquid state to a plasma. And the plasma consists of different fractions of hydrogen and argon. And then you smelt the hematite and bring it into liquid state. The melting point is only 50 Kelvin higher than that of iron. And then you reduce in that plasma in its excited exothermic state you then reduce the material in the molten state. And due to the factor of two difference in the, in the mass, the iron sinks down and you can gather it. So that is a very, very efficient way of producing also green steel. And we go through the same type of uh, detailed microstructural analysis uh, down to the atomic scale, but I think there's not so much room to repeat all of that here. It's just to give you a flavor of what kind of research we are doing. One other aspect when we look at the more complex uh, circular economy challenges is that we are also interested in using the waste of existing uh, industry processes. And one very important uh, waste product is the um, so-called red mud. The red mud, as you see here exemplarily, is an industry waste that you retrieve from aluminum production. Aluminum production proceeds, as you know, by bringing aluminum oxide into a fused liquid metal salt ionic liquid state and subject it to electrolysis. However, the aluminum oxide must be first gathered from the original ore, and that is called bauxite. And the bauxite is not pure aluminum oxide, but carries also a lot of 
iron oxide, titania, and other oxides. So you get a lot of very high alkaline uh, poisonous uh, dumped material on the planet. And we make use of that. And you see here the magnitude of that challenge when you see such a typical dumped pond in which you can, you know, drown the pyramids of Giza or the Golden Gate Bridge or you know, a bit big soccer stadium and so on. So these ponds uh, are really big and we currently have on the globe more than 4 billion tons of this uh, industry, poisonous industry waste, but it is very rich in interesting metals. So we look into exposing this to our plasma reduction smelting method and indeed we're able, as was shown recently here in this uh, nature paper, to extract valuable metals from it. And that follows kind of a you know zero waste strategy where we get the iron nodules, so the pure metal out of this process, and the rest of the oxides can be rendered into a form of neutralized oxides and can be, for instance, used in the construction industry. So this type of reduction also works very nicely when you use not the original ores or minerals, but when you use the industry waste even, following a no waste strategy uh, design. So towards the end of my presentation, I hope I could convince you a little bit that the basic research on such industry aggregates like a direct reduction reactor, as you see here, as one example of green metallurgy, there are of course many, many others, can be quite interesting for different type of research branches from our field, starting from a microstructure scale, as you see here, for people who like to study phase transformations under redox conditions, porosity, the evolving microstructure, heterogeneous microstructures, phase transformation, as I've mentioned, the role of interfaces for transport or for damage, the mass balance and transport equations that I've alluded to, nucleation and growth phenomena, reoxidation and chemical phenomena that are associated with this type of processes. And we even go down to the atomic scales, as I've showed you, we have even been going down to the electronic scales to study the electronic structure features across these interfaces. So as a conclusion, I would leave you with the understanding that we need to better understand the atomistic foundations of green metallurgy, specifically of green steel production, if you want to understand how these processes work to design better and more efficient reactors. We can make use of many different types of uh, feedstocks as a uh, metal carrier, but also as reductant materials, where hydrogen is not the only target, but there are many other possibilities to do that. In, in a more specific uh, way, we can realize that hydrogen-based direct reduction has very sluggish kinetics, particularly in the last stage when we reduce the rustite into iron. And these aspects related to the microstructure uh, are of high relevance, as I showed you. As a second alternative, I showed you a slide about hydrogen containing plasma smelting reduction, which is a very efficient method to balance chemical reduction energy and electrical a reduction energy because you use electricity and that can be green or sustainable electricity to bring the gas into a plasma uh, state which is very reactive and renders the process exothermic which is usually an endothermic uh, reaction and i could show you that for one example of ammonia we also study the uh, green steel production with other hydrogen vectors and with that i thank you very much for your kind attention Thank you.